Well, thank you all for uh, joining me today online. Uh, it's a beautiful day in Colorado Springs. Um, I want to start off uh, first by uh, thanking uh, Leah D Davis Witherow um, for asking me to present in the Scholar Series this year and also to Meg uh, Poole for uh, coordinating everything. Um, really to the entire staff of uh, the Colorado, uh, the Pioneers Museum for giving us this uh, virtual format so that we could all get together um, today. Um, as you see here, this is the, the courtroom in the beautiful Pioneers Museum where we were to meet and I cannot tell you how excited I was to uh, to present in this room today. Um, I am I am infatuated with that room, I love it. But anyways, um, unusual circumstances require um, un uh, unusual means. So I'm, I'm thankful to be able to meet with all of you today. So um, the manuscript I've written is entitled In My Ain Country, Thomas McLaren, Walter Farquhar Douglas, and Thompson Duncan Hetherington, A Transnational Case Study of Scottish Migration at the Turn of the 20th Century. And for those of you who are scratching your heads and wondering whether you're at the right meeting or not. Um, you are, we, we will absolutely be focusing on uh, arts and crafts architecture here in Colorado Springs as the uh, three subjects of my study were all Scottish trained architects who came to the Springs. Um, but I felt given the current circumstances that uh, this was appropriate for me to speak on a larger theme that my manuscript um, hits on. And that's the uh, often overlooked and unseen connection between people and places. And especially given our circumstances today, where we're absolutely limited with the people and places that we can connect with, um, I thought it was appropriate to, to speak to that larger theme today. So as I said, this is uh, based off of a, a manuscript that I've written. So I'm gonna read from the manuscript some, as well as uh, kind of speak off the cuff. So you'll see me shift my eyes around and my cadence change a little bit, and, and that's why. So I wanted to start off talking about um, my personal connection to this research. Um, I've given this presentation a number of times and I've been criticized a couple of times for not speaking about my own personal connection to the research. And um, my connection comes through the Thompson, uh, Duncan Hetherington and Ann Hetherington home, which is at 218 East Columbia Street. Um, this is a picture of the house from 1902. And uh, this, the house was built in 1901 by this gentleman, um, Thompson Duncan Hetherington. He was a, a Scottish trained architect. And this was the, the family home that he designed for himself and his family and the Hetherington family lived in this house for uh, more than 75 years. So um, a, a couple of years ago my wife and I moved to Colorado Springs. My wife is originally from here and we had a, a very short window of time to, to move, two weekends to come look at houses. So of course we were looking at all the houses online and um, this house came across or came to our attention and my wife automatically recognized it as a house that she knew and it was the uh, it was the home of one of her childhood friends Alex and my wife remembered being in the house as a high schooler and as in college, and she always loved the house and always loved the neighborhood. Um, so before I even got to actually see the house in person or, or step inside of it um, and fall in love with it, it was a pretty much a foregone conclusion that this was going to be our home, and uh, we we're lucky that it is. Um, and uh, those of you that have studied people or historic people or historic homes, you can very quickly um, run into a, a dead end when you start looking into the homes and, and being the history nerd that I am and the nerd of old houses, uh, you know, I had to start researching this house and I did not hit a dead end. Um, I actually got, went down a rabbit hole that was very rich and very interesting. Um, and I quickly found out uh, about Thomas and Duncan Hetherington and his connection to Thomas McLaren and Walter Farquhar Douglas and their connection to Colorado Springs and, and their training in Scotland and how it connects to Colorado Springs and their connection to the community in Colorado Springs. And so I, I, it's been very much a, a passion project for me. And uh, I love speaking about it anytime that I can. On August 3rd, 1901, Thomas McLaren wrote a letter entitled to the citizens of Colorado Springs of the year 2001. And it counted the architecture of the city at the above date. McLaren's letter provided a balanced and detailed assessment of the built environment of the young city with praise and criticism for existing structures and those responsible for their design and construction. The letter also provided insights into the talented young architect's thoughts on architectural design, form and function, and the relevance and importance of architecture in its quote, unconscious, but nonetheless effective good influence in molding the character of the people. A native of Scotland and a highly trained and credentialed architect, McLaren immigrated to Colorado Springs just six years before his letter was included in Colorado Springs privately funded community time capsule in 1901. McLaren was not alone as a newly arrived immigrant to the front range of the Rocky Mountains. The region was quickly growing with the arrival of domestic and foreign migrants, lured by mining opportunities, the resort-like amenities of Colorado Springs, and the purported healing qualities of the high dry mountain air. 
Among those migrants who would also become prominent and active residents of Colorado Springs, and with whom McLaren would form close personal and professional bonds with the Scottish trained architects, Walter Forquar Douglas and Thompson Duncan Hetherington. So any of you that have, are, have studied local history or, 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 or have studied local architecture, you're probably familiar with Thomas McLaren. He is certainly the most well-known uh, of my subjects. Um, he was a very prolific uh, and, a, and a very highly respected architect uh, in the area during at the turn of the 20th century. Um, he was born in February of 1863, and he was the youngest of 11 children. He was raised on the family farm uh, at Middleton of Wolkwapel in, Thorn, in Thornhill, Scotland, which is in the, the southern part of the, the Scottish Highlands. So on the left here, you can see a picture of Thomas was the youngest. You can see him seated on the floor with some of his brothers, his father, his mother, one of his sisters. Um, and then his, the, the, his, the next youngest uh, was seated on the couch here. This is James Major Banks McLaren, and that's Thomas's brother. Um, and he also was an artist and an architect. And he drew the picture in the middle, which is the, uh, which is the family home where uh, McLaren, uh, with McLaren, Thomas McLaren and James both were, were raised. Um, Thomas's father, John McLaren, was a man of considerable means. They, they owned property, they owned an estate. And at the time in Scotland, um, it, it said that about 80% of all of the property in Scotland was owned by about 600 people uh, in the uh, mid 19th century. And so to own any property meant that you were pretty wealthy and uh, the McLarens were. And uh, Thomas's father was very politically connected as well. Thomas started his uh, architectural training at the Sterling High School, which was the local high school where he started art and architecture. And in 1880, he moved to London, uh, from, from Scotland to London, uh, London, England, where he lived with his brother, James, who had already gone to London and was quickly establishing himself as a very reputable um, architect and artist. Um, when he was in London, Thomas studied at night and started working as an architectural apprentice. He won a lot of the uh, uh, lot of the profession's highest awards. He, uh, many of his sketches were published, and uh, he um, was admitted into the very exclusive um, and prestigious Royal Institute of British Architects. Uh, he did establish a, a, an architectural practice in London prior to coming to uh, the United States, and he moved um, to Colorado in uh, 1893 and he moved to Colorado like many people did for his health. He uh, suffered from tuberculosis and his brother James, who uh, he was highly influenced by and very close to, had just passed away uh, a year before he migrated to the Springs. Um, so he came uh, to, to here, he came to the Springs and he quickly reestablished his practice and became very, very well known. Um, he died in December of 1928 and he was buried uh, at the Evergreen Cemetery here in Colorado Springs. Um, he never married. He never had any children. Uh, he really, he was really, really focused on his on his life's work as an architect and an artist. And uh, he lived in the El Paso Club, which still exists. Uh, many of you are familiar with that. He lived uh, in a bachelor's room at, at the on the third floor of the El Paso Club, which he was he was a very, very uh, active member of the El Paso Club. Now, Walter Farquhar Douglas, uh, also a Scotsman, uh, was not born in Scot Scotland. He was born in Madras, India. His father, Colonel, um, Colonel Douglas, was, served in His Majesty's Army in India. So he was born in Madras, India. And in 1868, when, when Walter was younger, um, still a young boy, the Douglases moved back to Colonel Douglas's home city of Edinburgh in Scotland. And, and they purchased and owned and moved into um, this uh, very large stone townhouse on Magdala Crescent in the posh west end of Edinburgh. So much like the McLarens, the Douglases were a family of, of considerable uh, means as well. Um, Walter started studying architect uh, when he lived in this home and uh, he came to the United States in the late 1880s. He settled in Colorado Springs in 1890 where he was listed as one of only five architects in the city. Of course, the city was only about 20 years old at that time. Um, he and his wife lived in this house, uh, one of the first houses designed and constructed in the Broadmoor area. Still there, it's very close to the hotel actually. Um, and uh, they never had any children either that there's any record of. I've never found any record of children. Um, they at some point moved to New Orleans um, at the, at the, in the early 20th century, and he died in New Orleans in 1941. Uh, his body was brought back to Colorado Springs by his wife, and he too is buried in the Evergreen Cemetery here in Colorado Springs. And this is a picture of him, of course, uh, at, right around the turn of the century. Thompson Duncan Hetherington, also a Scotsman and, and much like Douglas, wasn't born in Scotland. He was uh, born in Canada. At the time, Canada was still one of the dominions of the British Empire and the uh, Hetherington family had moved to um, Canada just a few years before Thompson was born there. Um, 
and uh, Thompson was born just a couple weeks before his father passed away. And after his father's passing, the, the family all moved back to uh, their native town of Newton Stewart in the southern part of Scotland. And on the left here, you can see Thompson is the youngest of the three boys uh, with his brothers here and his mother. When they returned to Scotland, the family broke up. They, they lived in a bunch of different houses. And uh, this house in the middle, this row house, it's a, it's a two bedroom row house or two room row house in Newton Stewart where uh, Thompson lived with his grandmother and aunt, a boarder, um, one of his brothers, and a couple of his cousins. So about seven, seven or eight people um, lived in a two room house uh, where he started his architectural training. So unlike uh, McLaren and Douglas, he, he came from, from very, very modest um, means. He, uh, he emigrated to Chicago in 1883, where he joined his, his two oldest brothers um, there, and his, uh, his uh, middle brother was also an architect, and it's very likely that they, were, they settled in Chicago to help rebuild Chicago after, after the Great Chicago Fire. Um, and then in 1896, Hetherington, well, actually a few years prior to that, he moved to Denver where he met his wife, and then he came to the Springs. Uh, he too suffered from tuberculosis. He, he left Scotland um, after his, his um, second youngest of the, McLaren, or the Hetherington boys passed from tuberculosis and his mother passed from tuberculosis as well. So he joined his brothers in Chicago and then made his way to, to uh, the Front Range in Colorado, like many people did at the time, to seek a cure from tuberculosis. And uh, what I find fascinating about these individuals is their, their connection, despite their, their very, very different um, backgrounds. I mean, they were born on different corners of the earth. Um, they came from totally different upbringings, uh, both from, from wealth and, and relative poverty. And the fact that they all ended up architects, they all ended up in Colorado Springs around the same time, and that they all worked together on, on, on uh, various professional and, uh, and personal endeavors. I just think it's a, a fascinating connection between these three. Now, as I mentioned before, um, they came to Colorado Springs primarily because of their health, as many people did at the time, and, and many of you are aware, that at the time Colorado Springs was known as a place with the ideal um, environment or the ideal climate for people um, that were suffering from tuberculosis. So consumptives came here to seek a cure, and there were sanatoriums all over Colorado Springs at the time. Um, there was also an enormous amount of wealth at Colorado Springs at the time, uh, especially after the 1894 gold boom in Cripple Creek. Um, there were wealthy people from all over the world who came to the Springs, both uh, to seek uh, fortune and for their health. And so um, the subjects in my study knew to come to Colorado Springs for their health, but they also knew there was this growing bourgeoisie population that needed lavish homes and building blocks. And they knew they could come here to, to, for their health as well as to quickly reestablish um, themselves as architects and they would have a livelihood and career here. So let's dig into their architecture. Um, now with their apprentice training beginning in the late 1870s, all three of my subjects were thrust into a profession that was responding to a new approach to art that became known as the arts and crafts movement. And what the arts and crafts movement was, essentially it was a philosophic counter reaction to a lot of the modern ills of 19th century England. It was a, uh, it was a reaction against the industrial revolution and that impact that it had on the landscape, on people, on the, the end products of industrial society. And so um, what the arts and crafts movement asked people to do was to, to react against this, to, to make designs that were contrary um, to industrialization. And so as this applied to architecture, what it meant was reconnecting artists and designers with laborers and craftsmen, um, returning architecture to traditional forms of the area so where it was being constructed, constructed, so vernacularism, Gothic architecture, um, reintroducing uh, naturalism, reintroducing um, uh, um, building materials that were, that were locally um, sourced, um, building structures that were congruent with the natural environment that looked like buildings that look like they belong in the places where they're being built. Um, and also a simplification in ornamentation. Um, so in its purest form, the arts and, crafts, uh, arts and crafts architecture wasn't a specific style of architecture, but rather a, an approach um, to design. Now, um, I've not been able to locate any of the works that uh, Hetherington or Douglas might have worked on while they, when they started their um, careers in Britain, but I, I know for sure that um, McLaren had established a practice prior to coming to the Springs, and uh, he had three commissions that were built before he moved to the United States. Uh, the first one here in the bottom picture is uh, Oaklawn at Crowley Down, and that's in southern England. The one on the right here is the Horn Vicarage at Surrey, which is just south of London. And when I went there to visit it, it was under renovation. So that was nice to see. 
And then the third one in his only Scottish commission uh, is on uh, George Street in Dune, Perthshire. And that, was, that, that building is, is just outside of where uh, McLaren was raised. Um, now, all of these, these works that McLaren originally did in Britain, they all showcase these, these typical Scottish or British arts and crafts characteristics. And contemporaries of my subjects um, were people whose names became synonymous with arts and crafts architecture in uh, Britain, especially in Scotland. So like Charles Hen Harrison Townsend, CFA Voice, Robert Stoddard Larmer, uh, William Richard Letheby, and most notably the Scottish arts and crafts uh, artist, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. And these are some of their works that you can see here. Um, now, had my subject stayed in Scotland, I think it's very likely, if not inevitable, that they too would have contributed to this larger body of Scottish architecture. Um, as as uh, all these individuals, they knew each other. They either knew each other or certainly knew of each other's work. And they all had one thing in common, and that's that they were all highly influenced um, by the pioneering work of Thomas's older brother, James Major Banks McLaren, who I mentioned before. Um, James Major Banks McLaren's uh, works especially these works for Sir Donald Curry in Fortingal, Scotland, became known as some of the earliest and most influential examples of the arts and crafts vernacular style. So James, uh, Thomas worked with James for a while and he influenced, uh, James influenced this younger generation of architects that came behind him. Now these are all of his works in Fortingal, Scotland, and I'll talk a little bit about more about Fortingal in a minute, but it is a, an idyllic little fairy tale town in the Scottish Highlands. And um, it was basically the estate of Sir Donald Curry, who was a, a, a member of parliament at the time. And um, James Major Banks McLaren was commissioned to, to, build this, um, to build this working estate to look like, um, to, to look like an old working farm. And, and that's what he did. And it's a, a gorgeous place. And if you ever have the opportunity, do not hesitate um, to go there. Here's some other of James James's influential works here. Um, these are, uh, this is the Sterling High School. So that where the McLaren boys first uh, began their architectural and artistic pra practice was the, the high school. It's now the Sterling Highland um, Hotel. Um, James built an addition which included um, this tower and that's very, it's had an influence, influence on, on a younger generation of architects that came behind him. And also a, a building block here, which is just gorgeous, um, right around the corner from this hotel in Sterling. And this work in the bottom is the one that Thomas hoped that his brother would be most well known for. And this is the uh, city council in the town of Aberfeldy, which is just outside of, of Fortingal. So these were the influential works of James Majorbanks, uh, McLaren. Now, going back to the theme of connections, um, those of you who have studied you know, regional architecture here are familiar with McLaren, but you would be surprised as I was to know that there are people um, in Scotland who know a lot about Thomas McLaren. Um, there's a group called the James M. McLaren Society that's based out of Fortingal, Scotland, and it is, uh, it's, it's run by this beautiful, lovely couple, um, Rosie and Neil Hooper. And uh, they've been working there since 2005 to continue to preserve, um, per, to continue to preserve Fortingal as it stands today um, from development and the encroachment of developers. And they, and they do this through the James M. McLaren Society. And uh, this picture of James McLaren here, this is a book by Alan Calder, who's an architect who, who wrote a, a book about James McLaren's pioneering work. And they also publish an annual uh, journal. And I was uh, honored to have the work that I've done on uh, McLaren and the other sub Scottish architects in Colorado Springs included in their journal this year. Um, so there's a picture of Pikes Peak in this little Scottish architectural journal that's published uh, in the Highlands. So a pretty cool connection that continues to exist today between Scotland um, and Colorado Springs. So um, I don't think my subjects would ever have referred to themselves necessarily as arts and crafts architects, but they, they certainly were. There's no doubt about it. Um, they all trained in Britain, which was the, the cradle of the arts and crafts movement. Um, and when they came here, they didn't abandon these principles that they, were, that they were trained with. And you can see this in their designs and their works. Now, again, we talked about kind of this arts and crafts, how it applied to architecture and the, the, the permanence and environmental impact of architecture. Um, this required architects to follow the native or the local building tradition. So um, if you were an arts and crafts architect, you should, you should return to um, structures that looked like old structures. Well, when McLaren, um, Douglas and Hetherington came here, of course, that would have been very troublesome for them because at the time, um, the city had only been founded for about 30 years and there was no, what, what McLaren called no native Coloradan building tradition. 
um, of course there was a building tradition because the Utes were here for for generations and generations but um, they had they had no blueprint to follow and so what happened is that um, this absence of a native architectural tradition it allowed them to adapt and experiment with their designs and to evolve and expand their thoughts on the built environment here and so the result was this architecture that combined the influence of their individualism their training uh, their appreciation uh, for organic and functional design, and of course, uh, the uh, the tastes of their wealthy American financiers. And the result is a very eclectic mix of architectural size, styles that were all fused together, uh, and these buildings and homes that are in Colorado Springs that I contend are as authentic and unique a representation of uh, arts and crafts architecture that any American city can boast from this period of time. So these are some of their commercial and ecclesiastical um, structures. Uh, this one in the top left-hand corner, I always talk about this because for preservationists here in Colorado Springs, it's probably one of the most, um, you know, one of one of the, the saddest examples of what happened during the, the herbal, urban revival movement in the 60s and 70s. And it was, this is the Burns Theater, and it was a gorgeous theater on the outside and the inside, and it was, uh, it was raised in the 60s or, or late early 70s. Um, this was designed by uh, Douglas and Hetherington, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful theater. And I'll, I'll mention it again later on. Uh, to the right here is the City Hall in Colorado Springs, which was designed by, by McLaren uh, primarily, um, and still exists and functions as the, uh, the City Hall. Um, here in the bottom right-hand corner, this is the, uh, the Municipal Utilities uh, Building, and this was designed by Hetherington. And, and it's, what's cool about this is it's, it's a really cool example of Art Deco architecture, and I don't think that any of the subjects in my study ever did any other Art Deco architecture. So it's truly a, a stepping out for Hetherington. Uh, it's a beautiful building. It's called the Gold Room today. I've, I've never been inside of it, but I, I absolutely love it. And on the left, this is St. Stephen's uh, Chapel that's still here today. Uh, McLaren, this is not the, the big temple that, that faces Tay Home, but the, the original structure behind it. Um, and this was the original sketch that McLaren did for St. Stephen's. And this was actually used as the blueprint for a number of Episcopal um, chapels throughout the United States. The, the Episcopal Church um, adopted the sketch of McLaren and Hetherington to be used for, for new cathedrals throughout the country. And there's still some that exist, I think, in, in both Oklahoma and Kansas. Now, I find the uh, residential structures of McLaren, Douglas, and Hetherington to be the, really the, the, key, the key of their work. Um, at the arts and crafts movement also necessitated people to take a focus off of big lavish palaces and and homes for the uber rich and you know these types of things and so it's supposed to focus on the homes of ordinary people and these homes are not the homes of ordinary people obviously but they were all they were all single family residences believe it or not and they're and they're gorgeous homes um and when I talk to people about architecture, especially in the in the old North End or in the the near North End, the Weber Wasatch area, especially when I have like that, there's out of towners and we're either walking around the neighborhood or driving, and people that like architecture, they'll look from house to house to house and they'll just say, "What you know? What is this? Is this Tudor? Is it Queen Anne? Is it you know Spanish Revival? Is it you know Dutch Colonial Revival? Is it Craftsman? I mean, what is it?" And my stock answer now is yes, because it's all of those things. And sometimes you will see in these designs a number of those styles crossing over in, in one individual structure. And that's what makes these so unique is that they're, they're not just all colonial. They're not, they're not all just Tudor. They're not all just craftsmen. They're every style. And sometimes they're, they're styles that are all mixed together. Um, so again, as I said before, um, arts and crafts architecture wasn't defined by by a specific style, but rather this approach to architecture, and, and you can see this. So I'm going to talk about some of my favorite structures here. Um, the first one here is the All Souls Unitarian Church uh, on Tejon Street, and it was designed by Douglas in 1892. And what is cool about this is it is a very, very intentional and obvious blending of both American architectural characteristics and Scottish architectural characteristics. So this would typically be called an, an East Coast shingle style structure and that's uh exemplified as you know has all these uh, wooden shingles throughout the facade it has this this very um uh, deep sloping gables and then also it's called a shallow roof overhang here and with this douglas incorporated unmistakable scottish characteristics this uh, no, uh, uh normanesque tower which cuts through this cross gabling here and then the heavy use of locally quarried stone along the foundation so a very obvious blending of both scottish architectural characteristics and American architectural characteristics. 
Um, now, Thomas McLaren was very, very outspoken about the style of architecture that would be most fitting for the Pikes Peak region. Again, um, arts and crafts architecture, uh, it asked designers to design structures and construct structures that looked like they were born in that environment, that like they grew up organically from the soil. Um, and considering the dry and sunny climate and the reddish brown landscape, and also the fact that Colorado Springs is on the same approximate latitude as the Mediterranean, uh, McLaren advocated a style that was based on Spanish and Italian models, is that, that which would be most suited for the region. And the two most successful examples of this, I, I believe, are, are these two structures here. This is the Cragmore Sanatorium, which is now Main Hall at UCCS. And then here, the beautiful Pauline Chapel that was actually designed between, um, uh, uh, when McLaren and Hetherington were in practice together. So two uh, beautiful, um, beautiful representations of McLaren's uh, view that architecture here should be based on Italian and Spanish models. Now, another interesting connection here, there was a young draftsman named James Osborne Craig who worked for McLaren in the Springs between 1909 and 1914. And he later um, moved to Santa Barbara, California. And there he helped popularize what became known as the Spanish colonial style in Santa Barbara. So if you're ever in Santa Barbara looking at homes and buildings and they're this, you know, Spanish colonial style, it's, it's probable or possible that they were um, designed by James Osborne Craig and James Osborne Craig was influenced by McLaren's works when he worked here. So a connection between Colorado Springs and uh, Santa Barbara, California. Now, of course, my favorite, um, of course, is the uh, Thompson D and Ann Hetherington home at 218 East Columbia. And as I mentioned before, Hetherington designed this as his family home in 1901. And what I love about this house is that uh, this, this truly shows this intentional fusing of designs as well as this true arts and crafts uh, tenant that you sh one should focus on a normal and ordinary homes. Like, again, we look at those big lavish homes. This is a very modest home um, for he the Hethering built for himself. And he very intentionally fused um, three different regional architect architectural styles in this one home. So he could have built whatever kind of style he wanted of home he wanted for himself, a Tudor, a Queen Anne, he could have built whatever. And what I love is that he built something that was very eclectic and, and fused these different styles together. So this, is, this would be called a bungalow style house. Um, it, it may be the first bungalow that was created in Colorado Springs, if not the first, one of the firsts. 1901 is very, was very early for bungalows. It's typically around the 20s where they started uh, becoming more popular. And uh, the bungalow style originates in the Indian subcontinent. It is a, a Bangla style, which is, uh, which is described as a, a single family, um, one to one and a half story residence with a large veranda or porch and, and deep uh, eaves. So this is a this is the foundation of this house is it comes from the Indian subcontinent. Um, and then what Hetherington did is he tacked on unmistakable Scottish characteristics, um, the heavy use of locally quarried stone, uh, a wide arched entryway, which is typical, very typical of uh, of Scottish vernacularism. Um, what's called asymmetrical balancing on the facade. Um, uh, this decorative half timbering in the top and this rough cast harling in between and Oriel window, windows. One thing that's interesting, and if you ever walk around in Colorado Springs, this, what's in between these, these decorative half timberings, it's called rough cast, car, rough cast harling. Um, and it is, it is um, very, very common in, in Scottish architecture, especially uh, like normal homes and buildings in, in old Scottish architecture. And it's called pebble dash sometimes too. And a lot of other places in the United States, uh, if you see this decorative half timbering, of course, is very common, but you usually see plaster here in here or uh, stucco. And I've, I've never seen rough cast harling in, uh, in between um, decorative half timbering anybody anywhere else but in the springs and so it's a pretty unique feature um, to the architecture here in Colorado Springs. So there's Scottish and uh, and British or an Indian um, features and then what interestingly Hetherington did is he incorporated um, characteristics that became associated with the craftsman style in the United States uh, years later and so things here like this uh, L braced knee brackets, um, squared porch columns what are called uh, mortise and tenon joints and then um, exposed roof rafters. So, I mean, Hetherington took Indian, Scottish, and American ca characteristics and fused them together to build this very, very unique home for uh, himself and his family. 
So individually and in partnership, um, the three subjects of my study designed at least 70 structures that are still exist here in the Pikes Peak region. 16 are designated on the National Register of Historic Places and three are on Colorado State's Register of Historic Places. And uh, you know, these structures, they, they were and they remain just vital um, to the, the composition of Colorado Springs built environment. And they also, I mean, they're structures that are really truly rooted in the fundamental tenets of the arts and crafts movement. And they, they endure as a link between Colorado Springs and, uh, and the, the British arts and crafts movement. So again, I wanted to, as I started off, I talked talk about how I want to talk about these connections um, between people and places. And I, I thought this is an ideal time to talk about the, the social involvement and philanthropy of my three subjects uh, as well. Um, this is part of my manuscript as well. I don't get to, to speak about it as often, but I, again, I thought about this whole, um, where we find ourselves today, and, and I thought it was an opportune time to talk about some of these things. So um, very soon after they got here, uh, McLaren, Douglas, and Hetherington all became involved in social and cultural activities of all sorts. Um, and what they helped do is contribute to this sense of European refinement that is really what the founder, what General William Palmer wanted. I mean, he wanted a, a city on, on the front range of the Rocky Mountains that would rival any resort city in the East Coast and, and those in Europe as well. So he really envisioned Colorado Springs as being this, this place of European refinement for the wealthy. Um, and he actually called it his new Eden. Um, and uh, the subjects in my study got here and they all became quickly involved in all kinds of social endeavors and they helped to, to, um, to create or to, um, to expand this sense of European uh, refinement. So Colorado Springs was very widely recognized as a place where both consumptives and non-consumptives could benefit from and enjoy the quote, sunshine, dryness, openness, and opportunity for open air life. So outdoor pursuits were very, very popular. And what they were essentially is they were this reaction against the confinement of urban life. And very quickly, um, the most popular outdoor sport became the royal and ancient game of golf. And surely, um, it was supported and promoted by the very large, influential Scottish community that was here. And uh, Mc McLaren, Douglas, and Hetherington were all members of the uh, two most prominent clubs here, the Cheyenne Mountain Country Club and the Town and Gown Golf Club. Um, in fact, uh, Douglas and Hetherington drew the designs for both of these clubhouses. Um, this clubhouse, the Town and Gown Golf Club, is, is no longer in existence, but the, the clubhouse here is actually, part of it exists as a single family residence still today. It's on the corner of El Paso and Columbia. And uh, it, actually, later on, the Town and Gown Golf Club actually evolved into the Patty Stewart Jewett Memorial Field and the Patty Jewett Golf Club. Um, I like to talk about these two. I think it's an interesting story about Cheyenne Mountain Country Club and the Town and Gown Golf Club. The Cheyenne Mountain Country Club was really a place where people went to socialize. It's where the jet set and people went to be seen and they maybe would play a little bit of golf and, and probably do more, more drinking and socializing. Um, the Town and Down Golf Club actually started in opposition to this because people wanted a place to go where they could really play golf. Um, and that's what the Town and Gown Golf Club became. It became the course for the very best players. And interestingly, and in a very early time too, it was also uh, allowed both, both men and women to be members. So women could play golf there as, as well. Um, and uh, a lot of people went there to, um, to, to be coached by um, the Scottish pro who was the, who was the pro of the club. His name was Willie Campbell. And so they wanted to play with Willie Campbell and all the best players of the city played here. Um, and this reputation for this club became known worldwide. In 1901, the world champion golfer, uh, Harry Barden, came to Colorado Springs and played this course and, and commented on how great it was. Um, it was later closed down and it uh, became the Patty Stewart Golf Club or Patty Jewett Golf Club, which still exists here today. It's one of my favorite places in town and you're very likely to catch me there on any given weekend or weekday, either playing golf or just having dinner. But uh, the clubhouse here was actually, uh, this was built by McLaren. This was designed by McLaren. So um, this connection between Scotland and Colorado Springs that uh, initiated with these Scottish migrants here who wanted to play golf and these clubs, just like Patty Jewett, which still existed today, this is an enduring link between the Scottish migrants in Colorado Springs and Colorado Springs today. I mentioned before that Thomas McLaren never married, never had any children, and being the youngest of, of the family, he inherited most of the McLaren estate. So when he died, uh, his, his estate was quite large. Um, at the time of his death, it, he, there was about, he had about $54,000 in cash. He owned all of the family properties in Scotland. So most of the cash and the properties he gave to his nieces and nephews that were uh, scattered throughout Scotland and Britain. But he was very um, aware and concerned about making donations in Colorado 
um, that would help benefit his causes here in death, and then also to uh, his native his native area of Sterling. So he left all but six of his personal sketches, all of his blueprints, all of his professional library, and fifteen thousand dollars to uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder, with the hopes that it would that they would use it to start a uh, an architectural school there. Now I've talked to some people there, and we can't they they can't confirm a link. Uh, between this donation and and the architectural school at uh, at CU, um, but all of his uh, sketches and pictures of him and books they all remain in their special collections and you can find those online. Um, he also left eighteen hundred dollars in some of his um, and some of his sketches to a couple of his employees and his draftsmen. He left two thousand dollars to the First Presbyterian Church, um, and he left uh, he also donated. Uh, left a two thousand dollars as a fund to, to the live in perpetuity to be awarded to the best art student at the sterling high school where he began his artistic and architectural career and that uh, award exists to this day the uh, high school of sterling gives the the annual thomas mclaren award for the best artist in their school so in death he was certain to make sure that he would be able to continue to uh to uh, promote causes that he that he felt um that he felt uh, a passion for now, unquestionably, uh, the Caledonian Society of Colorado Springs was the primary, most significant avenue by which McLaren, Douglas, and Hetherington directed their philanthropic endeavors. Um, it was essentially, the Caledonian Club was essentially a Scottish club that was, that was formed to preserve their culture. You can see some of the club here seated. This is at the El Paso Club at a banquet. And you can see um, uh, there's McLaren, Douglas, and Hetherington all there. And the executive committee uh, in 1917, Hetherington served as the chief, the president, and McLaren served as the secretary. And what they did, besides just, you know, celebrating culture and, and reading, you know, Robert Burns and stuff, is they also were, were there to aid uh, Scottish migrants or people of Scottish heritage that had fallen on rough times here in the community. So they assisted in, in helping people get back on their feet, paying medical bills and things like that. But the most significant and long-lasting benevolent undertaking by the Caledonian Society of Colorado Springs actually it was directed by Hetherington and McLaren. McLaren was especially involved. Um, it wasn't for the benefit of residents of Colorado Springs, but rather for Scottish men and families who had been affected by the Great War, uh, World War I. Um, and it's an undertaking that uh, continues to link Colorado Springs to a place called Long Nittery, Scotland. So in 1917, a group of people got together in Edinburgh and they formed the Scottish Veterans Garden City Association. And, and what this was, it was, a, it was a group that wanted to help the, the families uh, of injured soldiers and injured soldiers themselves. And so what they intended to do were build communities that were self-sufficient, where these disabled veterans and their families could live and, and provide for themselves and, and, uh, and, and create a livelihood for themselves as well. And so uh, this, is the original, uh, this is the original layout for the first Scott and Gar Veterans Garden City Association in Long Nittery, Scotland, which is just south of Edinburgh. And uh, I worked with the people in their archives. To, to, I dug this up, and they hadn't looked through anything for a long time. And so it was it was cool to find this, and I got an opportunity to go to go visit this original um, uh, this original community, which still exists. But you can see here, nowhere on here does it say anything about Colorado Springs. So that that, that continues on with my story here. So. Um, in July of 1915, uh, a letter came to Colorado Springs and it appealed to the Caledonian Society uh, of Colorado Springs to uh, help them raise money to start building these, these homes. And uh, McLaren and Hetherington quickly uh, jumped to action on this and they organized an evening of Scottish entertainment at the Burns Theater and they raised a very significant amount of money, a, a lot of money from the very wealthy people in Colorado Springs from you know, your, your Strattons and your Burns. Um, and they raised a significant amount, about $2,700. Um, and this was donated to the Scottish Veterans Garden City Association on behalf of the citizens of Colorado Springs. And it resulted in, uh, in this, the Colorado Springs Cottage. So the first cottages of the Scottish Veterans Garden City Association were allocated to uh, wounded vets and their families on September of 1917. And among them was a double cottage home named the Colorado Springs Cottage One and Two. And the uh, Caledonian Society of Colorado Springs actually stayed connected with the people that lived in this cottage up until the time the society dissolved in uh, the, the, the mid um, 1950s. They would send an annual gift to the families living in this cottages on behalf of the people of Colorado Springs. So I like to tell this story. Um, it kind of gives me goosebumps every time I think about it. Um, 
I, again, I was able to go to uh, Long Nittery, Scotland, and, and visit um, this this original um, this original spot, Scottish Veterans Garden City Association um, home. And again, I, I couldn't I could I, I didn't know which one was the Colorado Springs Cottage, and they couldn't tell me uh, at the S at the, at the SVGCA which one it was because of privacy concerns and things. So they like just go there and knock on some doors, and someone will tell you. And so here I am, a guy. I get, I get off the train. I got a camera. I'm taking all these pictures, and you know, people are kind of peeking out their shades at me, trying to figure out what I'm doing. And I was going from door to door to door and asking people if they knew where the Colorado Springs Cottage was, and, and nobody had any idea what I was talking about. But they would make some jokes about how they were all combat veterans, and that it probably wasn't a good idea for me to be walking around there with cameras taking pictures. But anyway, they were all very pleasant. So I went to this house, and I knocked on the blue door and the red door, and nobody answered. Um, but I could see here in these vines a placard um, that was covered by vines and I'd come too far to not do what I probably shouldn't have and I jumped in these bushes and pulled away the vines and lo and behold there's the placard that designates this as the Colorado Springs Cottage of 1917. It was a very, it was a very um, emotional moment for me. So today, more than 100 years after its founding, um, this, this association still exists. It functions in its original capacity. So it still houses injured Scottish veterans. Now, of course, people that, um, uh, you know, probably from uh, Afghanistan or from the Iraq war. Um, also, there were some people there from like World War II that still lived in them. But um, today, there's a, they, this, they administer 624 houses on 76 sites in 35 districts. And uh, Colorado Springs Cottage 1 and 2 continues to um, continues to exist in its original capacity. And I'm working with the people at the Scottish Veterans Garden City Association in Edinburgh today to see um, what their willingness or, uh, or, uh, or their acceptability would be for, um, for a foundation to be started here in the Springs that could, that could reestablish this connection with the families here in this cottage. Uh, what I would like to try to do is to establish a foundation that would donate an annual gift to either provide routine maintenance for the home or the cottage or to do some landscaping work. Again, to just to reestablish this connection between uh, the people of Colorado Springs and, and this, uh, this home for uh, injured Scottish veterans. So um, I want to thank you all for joining me today, and I hope you enjoy the discussion on the arts and crafts architecture. And um, you know, as much as the, uh, the the larger themes that I spoke on, uh, you know, this this connection between people and places. And I'm, I'm going to finish with the the final paragraph uh, of my um, of my manuscript. And although it focuses on McLaren, I mean, I think it speaks to something much larger than that too. So um, here's my final paragraph, and then I'll I will open it up and and be happy to uh, answer any questions that I can. Thomas McLaren's gravesite in Colorado Springs Evergreen Cemetery is marked by a modest headstone with no mention of his Scottish heritage nor his life's work. At the bottom of McLaren's headstone appears the following passage, with God in his ain country. The passage is an unmistakable reference to the Scottish hymn entitled In My Ain Country, a solemn song written from the perspective of a Jacobite exiled in France who longs for the homeland that he will never see again. Although he was not living his life in exile, health forced McLaren to be forever removed from his beloved homeland of Scotland. It is unclear who chose to make an alteration to the hymnal passage engraved on McLaren's headstone, but the simple words etched there clearly convey that his life, experiences, and contributions were transcendent and unobstructed by any man-made boundaries. And that is it. I'm going to take my stop share, or the screen share down, and then Meg, however you want to proceed from here, I'm ready to. Excellent. Okay. Well, does anyone have a question they'd like to share with Barry? This is your chance to ask. And again, all you have to do at the bottom of your Zoom page, um, there's a little thought button or chat button and it says chat and you can click that and you can enter a question. So we have a comment, wonderful and enlightening, Sue said. So nice comment from Barry. We'll just give it a, a couple more seconds here if anyone wants to ask a question. Barry, I, um, oh, here's a great one actually. So how many structures are still standing in Colorado Springs? Yeah, from, from what I've identified, there's at least 70. You know, um, there's a number of resources that, that helped me identify these structures. Um, uh, History Colorado has a page on, on, on Colorado architects and so I was able to locate some of the structures through that. 
Um, there's also um, just from uh, some of the a book that's been published here on the Old North End on houses in the Old North End that gives me links to some of them. Um, the records aren't as good as you would find today, so you can't really you couldn't pinpoint I don't think all of the structures. Um, but also just in various archives, I was able to find pictures of homes and things like that. So I'm aware of at least 70. Awesome. Okay, we have um, Jennifer is asking, I heard you say about 19 are on the National or State Register of Historic Places. What about the other 50 odd structures? Yeah, I mean, those are just like, I mean, those are just like the house that I'm sitting in right now. You know, it's, it's just a regular residence. Someone just lives there. Um, the uh, the filing uh, or getting something landmark status on the National Register is a very, very complex process. Um, I, I don't have the time or, or the skills to, to uh, get this, all the structures here registered that I think are worthy of it. Um, it's, it's quite an undertaking. And so, I mean, if you, you know, if someone takes a bike ride or a walk down Wood or Cascade or Wasatch, you're, you'll go right by these houses that were designed by these individuals. And, and most of them you'd pass by and you, you wouldn't even know it. Um, we have uh, L. Connor asked, did these architects influence other architects builders in Colorado Springs? Um, well, the only other one I know of direct influence was with James Osborne Craig, who I mentioned before, who worked for McLaren and then went off to Santa Barbara, California and, and used uh, and popularized that Spanish colonial style. Um, I, I had enough to do with just digging into the work of these three architects, so I, I really don't know. Um, you know, there was a there was a, there were a number of architects that were working in Colorado Springs at the time. Of course, this was during the big boom at the turn of the 20th century for Colorado Springs. So there were there were many many builders here. Um, of course, I just focused on the three that had this very distinct Scottish connection, um, and the ones that I that they all worked together. There was um, um, Douglas and Hetherington worked together in practice. He, um, McLaren and Hetherington worked together in practice, and they all kind of practiced on their own as well. So I really focused on just those those three. So I'm I'm not totally sure about any other influences there. Um, Joyce asked, "Do you know why it was called Town and Gown Golf Club?" Man, I really don't. I think I think the gown has something to do with the fact that they were very very open about it being, uh, or very very I think proud and open about it being accessible for women to play golf there as well. So I think the gown is probably a reference to that. Why it was called town and gown, I really, I really don't know. Um, but I do think, I do think the gown was very intentional to say that they, that they were open to having both male and female members there. And it was, you can find some articles on town and gown um, through uh, Pikes Peak News Finder through the, the PPLD, and it's pretty cool. There's, some, they're really cool articles to see the, the layout of the course. And of course, when you go there now, there's a middle school, and you're just walking through neighborhoods. But uh, to think that you know, there's pictures there where um, you know people are once hitting golf balls. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. Awesome, a lot of great questions coming in. Um, there was a photo of Ivy Wild, but you yeah. didn't think about it. Could you elaborate? Yeah, well, of course, that was a that was a school. Uh, I think it was an elementary school, and it was designed by uh, by Thomas McLaren. So it was one of his designs. So any any of the pictures, the struct, any of the structures I showed there, they were all designed by either um, McLaren, Douglas, or Hetherington. So I just wanted to include that as one of the um, as one of the the structures. That they uh, that they were responsible for. There's pictures of City Hall there as well. Um, the, the City Auditorium. They were responsible for the construction of that as well. The Hagerman uh, Block Building. So a lot of buildings in downtown Colorado Springs they're responsible for as well. And so Ivy Wild was one of those. There was also a school um, right here, which is now uh, was the Steel School, which um, McLaren. It's no longer there, but the Steel School McLaren. Um, designed that. He won a bunch of national awards for it. It was uh, for popularizing a, a, a new design that was more functional for a schoolhouse, but it's it's no longer there. It's really cool that there's still public buildings that people can go and explore and see that. Totally, you're totally. You want to knock on people's doors to try and see the inside of their home. I've done that. Um, I've done a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Is your manuscript available? Yeah, actually. Um, so, and I'm, I think Meg was going to share some links. Um, I have a page on it's academia.edu. So I have a page there where I uh, where you can download and, or read PDFs of, of all of my papers, including this the full manuscript for this one. Excellent. Okay. And yeah, our goal is to um, once we get this video prepared, send out a video version of this as well as the the sources that Barry shared with me. So we'll share that with all of you, and I can probably put that in the chat function as well. Um, and then we have, was the remaining town and gown CC building moved to its current location or where was the country club? Yeah, no, I think it's in the exact same location. So there's, 
there's an article from the Gazette at the time when the Town and Gown Golf Club um, changed and the, the Colorado Springs Country Club or the Colorado Springs Golf Club moved north to what is now Patty Jewett. Um, there's a wealthy man who, who bought that home and it said he was going to move it. And I think he might have like turned it maybe, but it's right on the, it, it's so old, old maps of the city. You can see the Town and Gown Golf Club exactly where it is, where that house is today, which is on the, on the, um, the northeast corner of El Paso and Columbia. And uh, if you find pictures of it online, you can see it has these really interesting like square dormers on it. And you, you can also see right around that where that house is today and all the way up Columbia, there's a, a, this stone wall that kind of elevates it. And so that I believe that was probably part of the original club as well. So that would have been, so that would have been, so where the house stands today would have been, um, so it was in the westernmost part of the club. So the golf course actually went eastward from where, from, from El Paso. Mary, I have a question too. I, and I, I had to step out for a second, so I hope I didn't miss this, but do you yeah. know anything about the controversy of them select, selecting Augustus J. Smith to build the courthouse instead of one of these well-known architects? No, I don't. Um, I mean, I know about the courthouse. I know, um, I don't think McLaren was a fan of it. And I don't know if that had anything to do, um, I don't know if it had anything to do with him not getting the commission to do it. He also, um, when the original Antlers building or hotel was built, he, there was the, there was a competition to win that as well. And he didn't win that. And so in some of his letters, he criticizes the construction of the Antlers hotel. He kind of, he almost predicted that the fact that it would burn down at some point because he didn't think it should be wood and it should be stone. Mm -hmm. So he criticized that. And he also really, really disliked the, the mining exchange building, which is still there today, which is now the, the hotel. He hated that building and he thought it was just a terrible, he would, McLaren was a guy of a pretty big ego and he, he wrote a lot about himself and he actually published some things about himself. And he was, he was, uh, he was very concerned that he would be remembered as a, as a very, very important architect. And he had no problem uh, throwing criticism around at other architects at all. Hmm. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Mantha asked, what is the most interesting thing you discovered during your research? <sighs> the most interesting thing. I mean, the most interesting thing. That's a great question. I, to me, the most interesting thing is this connection between <laughs> between these individuals, and uh, I, I especially, and I, I mean, I probably say this for selfish reasons because because I'm sitting in this house that kind of led me down this rabbit hole to the research, and I I love Hetherington's story. I mean, I. I I love his story. I love it. A guy who was came from very modest means. I think that he kept, he, he remained very modest here. He lived in a modest home. Um, you read about Douglas and McLaren kind of being part of the, the jet set of society. They were always going to society functions. They both belong to the El Paso Club. There's no record of Hetherington. Um, his, his children, uh, his, his son grew up to become one of uh, the founding faculty members of the Duke School of Medicine. So he, is, he was, they were very, very, um, they're very educated. Uh, his, his wife passed away in this home. His daughter passed away in his home. His daughter went to CC. Um, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just absolutely enthralled by the story of Hetherington. And I, I find that there's like maybe a connection between, um, that always kept him separate from McLaren and Douglas. And I think there's this issue of class there a little bit because he didn't come from a wealthy background. And I don't, I mean, I can only surmise this, but each practice that he was in with those two always started with, it was McLaren and Hetherington or is Douglas and Hetherington. It was never Hetherington and McLaren ever. Um, and so I, I think that's the, that's the thing that's been most interesting to me. I think the thing that probably was most, uh, was most exciting for me was, was finding out about the Colorado Springs cottages. I mean, for me, that was just, that was just a really, really cool find. And um, there in the Pioneers Museum, as, as you know, Meg, there's a, in the archives there in the special collections, um, the, all of the records of the Caledonian Society of Colorado Springs were donated to the museum. So that's where I was able to piece through and find these pictures and all this correspondence. But just knowing that there was a place south of Edinburgh that says Colorado Springs on it is, is, is crazy to me. And that was, that was the most, that was the coolest part of it for me, I think. On that same topic, someone asked how many research trips you've taken to England and Scotland. Yeah, just one. I was, uh, I was very fortunate to, to win a, a graduate research fellowship at UCCS and that funded a trip to Scotland for me to go and do research um, in the summer of 2018. But I was there, I was only there for, uh, I think I was there for two weeks. And so it was, it was kind of a, 
it, it was a very much like a whirlwind um, whirlwind trip to, um, to to study and to learn. And I, I wish I had more time and I would love to go back there. Um, but it was uh, it, it, I, the, the, the manuscript would have been impossible to write without going there and to, being able to see some of these things and to, and to learn some of these things. Okay, looks like we have another question. Um, I know you had mentioned the Burns Theater. Did you have any further commentary on the structure or the loss of the structure? I mean, only that, I mean, I've, I, I found out about the structure because I was very interested. I, you know, went down this rabbit hole of the, of the Douglas and Hetherington architecture. And so I, I found, I, I knew that was one of the, one of the buildings that they designed and it said it had been demolished. And so I just did some Google searches for it and found stuff on it in Pinterest and things like that. And you look at these pictures and you cannot, I mean, there's no way that a structure that was that beautiful, it was that, I mean, that was that. Um, I mean, it's just a gorgeous piece of architecture that would never, that preservationists would never allow that to be destroyed today. It would never happen. It just wouldn't. And uh, so I, I've talked to other people, um, certainly people that are preservationists here in town, they, almost everybody knows of it, and especially people, of course, that grew up here, because it wasn't, I mean, it was just raised, you know, in the late 60s or early 70s. So people remember going to movies there and things like that. Um, but I, I think people look at that as as a true loss for downtown. And I think that it would still be an anchor of, of culture in downtown if it was still there. Um, it, it, was, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous theater. I, I, don't, I don't have all the specifics at, at, the, at, the, at my fingertips, but I know that there were a lot of very noted and, um, and, and um, respected artists that performed there in its time before it was, it, was the, it became the chief movie theater at some point is what it was called. I know a lot of people credit the demolition of the Burns for saving the what's now the Pioneers Museum. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think people look back on that and they just can't believe that it, that, 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 that that theater was allowed to be destroyed. It's yeah. like, oh my goodness, we need to do something to protect these structures. Yeah, exactly, exactly. At least we survived that, that period. Awesome, well, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I think we're going to conclude the program. I did include uh, the links that Barry had sent me earlier. Um, all sorts of great links that you can explore in the chat function. Barry, I just want to thank you for your time. This was absolutely wonderful. We had a lot of great um, participation. So thank you for everybody who, who turned up as well. And I know a lot of our volunteers and supporters are in the audience. So it's great to see you all. We miss you. Um, as I mentioned, our next program is coming up on May 9th. Megan Kate Nelson. She actually wrote a book. Um, so the program's called When the Civil War Came West. And there's an excellent book. You can find the information on our website. We're encouraging you. I know I just picked up my copy on Amazon um, to get a copy of the book and prepare. Her program is going to be more of a, a discussion with our curator, Leah Davis Witherow. And we're also hoping that you'll bring your questions as well. So um, come back May 9th. Be sure to register. And if you have any feedback for us, uh, feel free to email cosmuseum at springs or coloradosprings.gov. I'll put that in the chat function. And yeah. Uh, sounds like a lot of people said great presentation. Well done. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So very just great feedback and yeah. um, everybody have a, a stay safe, stay healthy and take care. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.